How is everyone doing this morning? Have y'all had a great morning so far? I tell you what, the information and the networking and the opportunity to learn and to be engaged at this convention has just been off the chain. And I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today. I am Mayor Julie Smith. I am the Mayor of the City of Tifton, and I'll be your moderator today. We have some exciting folks to hear from and only an hour to explore our topic, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, so we'll begin without delay. I'd like to introduce one of our speakers today. Bambi Hayes-Brown is President and CEO of Georgia Advancing Communities Together Incorporated. She previously served as Executive Director for the CRISP Area Habitat for Humanity Incorporated. She has 20 years of experience in rural and urban community and economic development, including the Housing Choice Voucher Program, Public Housing, HUDVASH, LHITC, CDBG, Home Investment Partnership, Tax Exempt Bonds, and Public Private Deal Structuring. She is an expert in everything in the alphabet soup of housing. She previously served as an interim executive director for the Southwest Georgia United Empowerment Zone Incorporated, where she played an instrumental role in obtaining a $20 million rural empowerment zone designation for CRISP and Dooley County. Later, she served as the Home Ownership and Special Programs Manager for the Housing Authority of DeKalb County. Ms. Hayes-Brown managed a $48 million housing program for low-income families, assisting thousands of families in purchasing their first home and transitioning homeless veterans and victims of Hurricane Katrina and Rita into permanent housing. She is a certified economic, economic development finance professional. She is a grant writer, home buyer educator, and comprehensive housing counselor. Ms. Hayes Brown is a native of Cordial, Georgia, and graduated from Shorter University with both a bachelor's in business management and an MBA. She completed additional studies in secondary education and is a doctor of business administration, student majoring in organizational leadership. That is a mouthful. <laughs> when do you have time to even breathe? I know. Man. I too. But on top of all that, as if that's not enough, she is also a real estate broker with Maximum One Realty Executives. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker. I'd also like to introduce to you uh, a friend of mine, Mr. Jeff Ledford. Jeff Ledford. He serves as the Senior Director of Governmental Affairs for the Georgia Association of Realtors. Joining the Realtors in 2016, Jeff spent the previous 23, year, 23 years in state government, serving first at the State Ethics Commission, then as Georgia's third real estate commissioner, and most recently at the Georgia Department of Economic Development. In addition to over two decades of state executive leadership experience, Jeff has recognized at the state, nationally, and international levels for leadership, innovation, and instituting organizational efficiency in administrative and regulatory governance. Jeff has also held standing columns in industrial publications, chaired several international panels related to policy development, legal issues, technology, and examination credentialing. He's been active in participation in industry boards and was named by the Atlanta Business Chronicle to Who's Who in Finance 2008-2010. Jeff is a graduate of the Georgia State University and currently resides in Kennesaw, Georgia with his wife Lisa and their seven children. So please welcome Mr. Jeff Ledford. <laughs> Before we take, uh, before we actually hear from our panelists this morning, we want to hear from you. Um, this program this morning, as you know, was about housing, and that's something that's very important to all of us in all of our communities. And just wanted to hear, um, and where, where is, where's my scribe? Michael's going to be our scribe. So as we throw out uh, your ideas, your concerns, your challenges in housing and how it impacts your community, Michael's going to write these up on the board, and then we'll have input from our so um, I want to hear from you. Uh, let's just take a minute to talk about um, the inventory that you have in your community when it comes to housing, whether it's workforce housing. We're just talking about the naming of housing, and workforce housing, affordable housing. Um, what are the challenges such as zoning or development? Um, Y'all want to throw any issues that you have from your communities as far as housing? Just, just throw them out there. What you got? Right. And there are old barn stalls. So we know that uh, new developers are going to come in and tear them down to build new stuff. Right. And uh, I want to make sure that as old stock like that that's currently affordable is torn down, that we have options for those residents to stay in our community. Right, 
exactly. So displacement of displacement residents, of yes. Of, we add new housing, right. they can't afford, I'm okay with that. It, but right. But where are those people going to go, go in the right. interim? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so displace aging stock and displacement. What other challenges do you see in your communities with regard to housing? Yes, sir. We're a college town, and the college piece is uh, driving up typically rental prices, but that also is taking the inventory down. Right. Because folks are buying those residences to turn them into rental properties for the city. Exactly. So, so workforce housing, ownership of workforce housing is really is key. It's key, exactly. Okay, that's a good point. We also, uh, in Tifton College Town, have this. I have those exact same issues. What else? Um, do you, does anyone have any problem with dilapidated properties, air properties, where you don't know who the owner is? Well, yeah, we had. Well, that, you know, remember, not the Okay, exactly. So, is it a corporation? Is it uh, an individual? Is it? Grandma Susie who passed away and left it to Cousin Bob who passed away and left it to Uncle Johnny who passed away but there was no deed ever recorded and who owns this property now? Exactly. Phantom owners, that's exactly right. What other what other issues do you see in your... What about short... Does anyone have issues with short-term rentals? We just left the human trafficking uh, program which was just amazing um, and they talked in that about short-term rentals, about you know how that impacts... Does anyone have any issue with, with that type of, of issue? Okay, so so potentially. And so you might call it, we call it boarding houses. They yes. Have, they they somebody buy a house and they'll like split it up into 15 bedrooms and we believe there's labor trafficking going. On. Sure. More than sex trafficking. Right. Yeah. So um, that's a concern both on human rights issue and, and on a housing and, issue. And having that many people, that much trash, and all that stuff is impacting. Exactly. Exactly. Any other issues? Homelessness. What about lack of housing? Just lack of housing. Lack of housing. Homelessness. And it's not, you know, it used to be the, you know, sort of the thought of homelessness is changing. Homelessness is not just individual anymore. It's families. It's people with children. You know, and, and I know in my community, it's amazing the number of people who are, are homeless with children. And there are places where people, if, if it's just an individual, but where do you take a family and how do you have resources for a family, um, especially if you have a male child in that family who's 15, 16, 17 years old. That puts a whole different, it's one thing if you have small children, but that, that's a challenge. Uh, what about Airbnbs, motel, hotel, th those kinds of things? I mean, you know, who's, if, yeah, exactly, who's going to, you know, if we know the Hampton Inn's paying hotel, motel tax, but we've got someone over here with Airbnb that's, you know, generating a lot of income for them. Do we need to regulate that? Is that that's part of our housing. How do, we, how do we deal with that? What about tiny housing? Does anyone have zoning regulations that you're saying, you know, tiny housing is the big thing. I wouldn't live in a storage shed with an air conditioner, but some people want to. <laughs> and, um... We're looking at, at, at people allowing more like cotton villages, like, right. like did, right. where if they have to be a big enough area, they can't just spot put in a right. 500 square foot house. Somebody wants to put 10 of them together with So it creates a little neighborhood of tiny housing. Right. We're Okay. Yes, ma'am. I was just reading this morning that in many towns in Georgia, someone has to work 61 hours a week to afford a two-bedroom home to rent. Right. I think that probably is an issue for all Affordability. Years. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. But I think for a lot Right. That is really oh, it is a cha significant challenge. Exactly. Yes, sir. I'm curious to know if anybody else in here has those tiny homes in their community. We don't. We don't. I don't think that we do. But I'd like to hear from anybody in here. Does, does anyone have currently have that? Like not you? Currently. Not currently. We. I know in Tifton we don't. Does anyone? Yeah. Don't have zoning to address that. Okay, so that's something. Zoning is certainly, and how we. What are your thoughts as, as elected officials? Do, uh, do you see that as a benefit, as a challenge? Do you think that's the the, the wave of the future? Um, 
Right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> To a certain standard, right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. The numbers didn't didn't line up for the for the project. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of come to us and even to just afford the land we're running out of the Right. We have one developer that was working on the number of acres putting Wow. Mm -hmm. That's density. <laughs> That's density. Yes, ma'am, in the back. How do we sustain that over time? <laughs> right. Right. <coughs> right. So, so again, the numbers don't line up when you start to do the math. Exactly. So, so those regulations. Any other quick comments before we turn these these challenges over to our experts to uh, to give us some suggestions? Michael, we got everything. Anything we need to add? Zoning. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Something we can certainly explore. Yes, sir. We like to reward from ownership, but we don't get no way to see more and more side for new probably next to those insurance stores right. depending on your insurance rate, so you're saying if you don't have a great insurance we twice as much for insurance. That's right. You gotta make more to you. So we love you from So that it so that it does become more affordable. Your the bulk of your payments not going towards insurance and, and property taxes. Yes. Right. That's, and that's big. Right. And and begin to add up that have great impact. Exactly. Okay. All right. Waving of fees of some sort, or yeah. Then, then the numbers start. Right for that developer. Well, we see that you know in a lot of our downtown development with public-private partnerships and 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 those type of things. So maybe we need to expand those similar programs to include exactly. All right. 
At this point, we have a whole page worth of challenges <laughs> for our panelists to, uh, to help us with. So okay. we have two of the experts in the room. Thoughts, ideas, suggestions? One of the things that I would like to, I guess, stress is, you know, a lot of people, we get caught up in the term affordable housing, workforce housing. One of my colleagues in Athens used the term low-cost housing. And that could be low cost for anyone, uh, from your people who are at 120 uh, percent of AMI area median income all the way down to 30 percent of AMI or below. Um, in your urban areas, density is, is, I would say, probably one of the biggest problems, scarcity of land. In your rural areas, you have land, but not enough developers want to come in and develop in your rural communities. And um, I see that being from a rural area, born and raised, Southwest Georgia. Uh, hey, uh, Chairman Wiggins, <laughs> from my hometown of Cordill. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think we just need to, <clears throat> when we're talking to different audiences, <clears throat> I think the term low-cost housing kind of fits everybody. Um, and, you know, there, there are several challenges that I see in Georgia. Um, and I always think of one Georgia. So I don't like to get caught up in the, the, to the old narrative, there's Atlanta and then there's the rest of Georgia, uh, and then there's Southwest Georgia. <laughs> I heard that uh, one time. But, you know, what affects Atlanta affects the rest of Georgia. What affects the rest of Georgia affects Atlanta. So we got to work together to try to figure out some solutions to these housing problems. If I knew all the answers, I would be a billionaire. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I don't. Um, but one of the things that I see from municipalities is that they don't want to raise taxes. Um, and that is definitely understandable um, because people are, as you know, they complain if the, the millage rate goes up and the taxes goes up and then, you know, they're, they're complaining. So we have to kind of think outside of the box um, one of the things that I mentioned at a, uh, another conference was something like a uh, SPLOST, uh, where everybody can participate. You know, you go up a penny or something on a uh, sales tax. So you're not just taxing just the homeowners, but you have that revenue coming in and it's spread out amongst everyone. And that funding can be put in a pot of money uh, to be used for affordable housing, as we, as we call it, a dedicated source of revenue. Um, you know, when you're talking about the, um, your extremely low income individuals, and uh, thank you so much, I, I don't know the lady's name right here uh, with the white jacket on, was talking about the statistics. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, there is approximately 336 very low income families in the state of Georgia. And what I mean by very low income families, we're talking about individuals and families who are um, at or below 30% of area median income. So your senior citizens, your people who are pensions, uh, fixed income, and also including the homeless. Um, but out of that number, there's a shortage of about 236,000 homes in the state of Georgia to house those individuals. And those that do have housing, 73% are severely cost burdened, which means that they are paying 50% of their income or above due to housing, for housing costs and utilities. And in order to solve that housing issue, they're going to have to get subsidy. There's just no way around that. But that subsidy won't come from your local level. The subsidy has to come from the federal level. So it has to come in the form of housing choice vouchers. There's also been some discussion on the state level about providing some vouchers for low income in, uh, in individuals on the state level. But Georgia, for some reason, we're approximately the same size and population as North Carolina. And we're not receiving enough federal dollars from the federal government. And so we have to find out why. When I go to Washington, D.C., I'm always advocating for Georgia, uh, for all of Georgia, not just Atlanta. We've successfully advocated for them to turn, turn loose that disaster relief money, thank God, uh, <laughs> to help uh, individuals, businesses, and our farmers. 
Um, but, you know, we have to think beyond that. So we, we need to tap into those federal dollars, and we need to find out why our local municipalities, especially you, you all who are in entitlement communities, are not receiving those dollars. Um, we also need to advocate for more dollars to come to DCA so they can provide more incentives, uh, such as your low-income um, low housing tax, <clears throat> excuse me, low-income housing tax credits. And also looking at the National Housing Trust Fund. I know um, there's a development in Shamley uh, who has benefited from the low-income housing, um, from the National Housing Trust Fund. Um, and there's another one that is also coming up in DeKalb County uh, that is a public-private partnership using those National Housing Trust Fund dollars. So we really need to look, you know, we can't, we can't tax our way out of this issue. I'll be the first one to say that. We're not going to subsidize our way out of this issue. So we have to look at um, a myriad of solutions in order um, to house everyone, uh, not, our, not just our low-income individuals, but our workforce, our senior citizens, and everyone. Thank you. Jeff? <clears throat> sure, sure. And I think um, one of the things that, that always jumps out to me on this issue is uh, exactly what, what Bambi was saying, the, you know, what do you call it? Do you call it affordable housing? Do you call it workforce housing? We, we tend to refer to all this as housing affordability is the overall issue. That doesn't have any of the connotations necessarily with it, but it's all related. And, and I think of it kind of like the, the butterfly in the Amazon, you know, the old it flaps its wings, it makes this little animal sneeze, it what, does whatever, and then you have a thunderstorm somewhere. Um, it all connects. So when when we step back, and uh, I saw something that the, the realtors put out a, a little while ago called the missing middle. What it's addressing is you have houses way up here that are being built, and then you have the rental market, but the starter homes are missing. The, the affordability of being able to get started in home ownership is, is the missing element, and it's, it's disappearing in lots of places, not just Georgia, but that's what's affecting a lot of what we see. Uh, there's several ways you can start to attack that. You've got to recognize that the, the more you widen that gap, the longer people stay renters. And the longer they stay renters, the higher rents go up. And so whether it's a, a college town and you have students and the cost is going up and, and you, know, you mentioned that there's uh, a lack of inventory for the rentals, well, that's why, the, that's why it's going up. If people are acquiring the homes that people used to own uh, and live in as, as owner occupants and are now renting to college students, that's showing there's a need for that level. But you also are affecting the people who may need some of the, the federal assistance with that. And when that's having to cover a higher amount, then, then that's creating more of a strain on that system. But it roots back to that missing middle. If that middle is there, then you have a way to have the flow. Uh, the other thing that we're, we're looking at is, you know, you're talking about senior housing and um, uh, you'd mentioned tiny homes. Um, one of the things that we've seen some of our, some of my counterparts in other states have been looking at is addressing accessory dwelling units. So rather than saying single family housing is zoned this way and you have, you know, this, um, you know, this is what we've always had, this is what we're going to continue to have, to open that up a little bit and possibly have where you can, you can have one of these units, you know, and, and, and whether it is a, an in-law suite or whether it's something that's a detached unit. Um, I think when I was growing up, you had a lot of, a lot of the houses had these garage apartments. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, you know, there, you know, somebody would live when they were going to college, you know, as they kind of moved out but not really. Uh, or, um, you know, it, something like that had become where, you know, grandma moved into when she was still on her own, but you need to have somebody close to her type thing. Um, while those can be expensive, a lot of the reason they're expensive is because of some of the zoning that's thrown on it, some of the, uh, the, um, the, the codes that are thrown on it. If you look at some of the options that are available, um, it can become a lot more affordable. And so that's, that attacks another area, which is that we are, we are creating some of our own problem. Um, I, I did a search the other day of how many times in city council meetings just this year, so in the first six months of 2019, I think it was 227 times um, the issue of either housing affordability 
affordable housing or workforce housing uh, had been discussed at city council meetings. And that's not how many times within each one of those meetings, it might have been mentioned five times, that's filtering that out. So that's 227 city council meetings, the issue has been mentioned. So that tells us it's an issue. Um, but one of the things that throws more onto the cost of a home is when there are, when there are some of the additional requirements. I'm not talking about the safety, uh, the core elements, um, but when you have things that are more the, I think of them as kind of the, the, the loftier goals of a house. Um, if, if I want to look at what needs to be for the, the, the safety of a house, for the density to, to maintain, you know, it, it, the, more, the greater the density, the greater strain it has on your, uh, your plumbing, uh, your, your, your water supply, your sewage, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it also has on your, your infrastructure, everything around it. So that is something to consider. But when you have, we've seen jurisdictions that have set a minimum lot size of either one acre, uh, one of them we saw was discussing a three acre minimum. And it, it, it was kind of crazy because you look at it and you think, well, none of the houses that are built here are on that. And you look at what was, you know, what some of the, the downtown area, what, you know, what's around, and it doesn't fit with what you had. It was done because it was a, we want that type of development. We want to see better houses here. And what that's doing is it's, it's kind of like saying, I want to jump straight from A to, you know, Q, rather than A, B, C, and move up the chain. Um, you know, I... I think that is something that before we start looking at throwing more things in to try to fix a problem, uh, we need to look, are the things that we've thrown in there causing the problem? So if by requiring enhanced standards, uh, we're causing housing in our, our jurisdictions to be less affordable, then does it make sense for the, us to say, you know, um, and, and I'm not saying we're, you know, opposed to all forms of inclusionary zoning, but that's, that's kind of a band-aid on the problem when you look, step back and look at overall. Well, if we're requiring, if we're requiring structures to be built in a certain way where either the cost of the home or the rental, uh, the rental cost of that, of those units is going to be up here. If we step back and say, if it's just as safe, but perhaps it's a, a different cladding on the outside, or perhaps it doesn't have, you know, a smaller lot size or, or whatever else, you know, may be with that, then that hopefully could bring down, you know, incrementally some of those costs so that the rents are a little bit cheaper, uh, the housing is a little more affordable. And, and I think you'll have a, a greater mix in that. Uh, but that's just kind of a, a two cents throw in on that. And I know that's probably not, you know, that doesn't solve all the problems, but that's one step in the direction of, you know, when I look at reports from several different economists on this issue, it's we're, we're forcing our homes to be more expensive kind of outside of the organic flow. Um, you know, think about what was built in the 50s and the 60s in the sizing, how big rooms were, how big houses were, and you look at what we have now as some of the minimal requirements for a jurisdiction. Uh, the house I grew up in, I don't think could probably by its size and the way it's built, uh, and I, I'm not talking about, you know, building codes, I'm talking about aesthetics and the look of it. Uh, I don't think it could legally be built in the jurisdiction it was built in. And, you know, I grew up with, uh, you know, a brother and a sister, there were, you know, five of us in the house, and, and it was, you know, it was comfortable. It's one thing if the market is driving that people want more rooms and bigger, bigger rooms, but when you're requiring that as the base standard, that's, that's kicking up some of the housing costs another question. Um, I know this all just ties together um, in such a unique way. What do you do, uh, what are the challenges or do you have any advice or suggestions when you have um, people with no credit, literally no credit mm -hmm. or such severe credit, you know, bankruptcies or whatever's yeah. happened, mm -hmm. you know, how do we deal with those issues when it comes to being able to get into housing? Because you certainly can't get a mortgage. Mm -hmm. You certainly, you know, most, most tenants, uh, property management companies do right. screen their tenants right. for minimum credit scores and things like that. How do we deal mm -hmm. with credit issues? I would say, uh, coming from my background as being a housing counselor, uh, I remember back in the day before the housing market crashed, there were 
a number of HUD approved housing counseling agencies. And over the years, they have steadily dwindled. Uh, and that is concerning because financial literacy is so important. And I'm going to say, I, know, I don't know if there's any members of the Board of Education in here, but we have to start um, in elementary school, start talking about financial literacy, talking about savings, talking about building wealth. We have to start those discussions very early uh, because by the time they get into high school or get into college, especially those of you who are in college towns and they're taking out student loans and uh, they get all those fancy credit card applications in the mail. Um, you know, it, it, it's a done deal. Um, and they can bounce back from that, but it's a lot harder. <coughs> so we have, to, we have to talk about financial literacy very early and integrate that. Uh, and support our HUD-approved housing counseling agencies who provide these services at a uh, free or low cost. Um, now, what I have seen, uh, I'm going to put on my real estate uh, hat for just a minute. Um, you know, when I'm going in MLS, you know, just like the mayor said, you know, these uh, landlords or owners, they have quite lofty standards and they have a right to do, to do so. They want to screen their tenants, they want to make sure that the tenants are going to pay the rent, that they don't have any uh, evictions and, and those types of things. So, you know, I do understand that standpoint. Um, but, you know, we, we also need to look at maybe some other mitigating circumstances. So let's say someone has no credit or maybe had a bankruptcy, but they've also had, um, you know, an excellent rental history. Uh, in the past. So, you know, that's something that we, Georgia Act, we do policy and advocacy work uh, on the local, state, and federal level. Um, you know, working with some of our partners uh, who provide affordable housing um, to more or less give a, give a break. You know, look at the individual, determine the individual circumstances. Uh, now, in theory, uh, is that likely to happen? Probably not. Uh, I'm a former property manager as well. Um, but, you know, again, we have to start very early talking about financial literacy. Um, because if we don't do that, then we're, you know, we're going to have renters, we're going to have people doubling up. Uh, so it pains me sometimes when I'm, I'm in the rural areas and people say, oh, well, we don't have any homeless people because we don't have anybody living under the bridge. Well, people are doubling up, so you don't see them. They're what I call the invisible homeless. So homeless is everywhere. It's in my hometown of Cordials and um, where I live part-time in Fitzgerald. Uh, it's in Atlanta. It's everywhere. Um, but dealing with that, I don't know if the municipalities can actually solve that problem. Um, but working with agencies such as mine, uh, Georgia Act, where we can educate um, our apartment complexes to look at those, look at those options, look at the individual, uh, rather than just um, pulling up the information from uh, your credit reporting agencies or the, ag the uh, agencies that we use to look at evictions. Because even sometimes an eviction is filed, but it's not followed through but that eviction will follow them. Uh, and so that's something that we're looking at on the state level is doing some type of eviction reform uh, for those individuals. Um, but it's a challenge. I wish I had an answer uh, for municipalities. Um, but the, 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 the issue, I guess the answer is gonna come from our solution, is gonna come from our partners, uh, such as my fellow real estate professionals <laughs> here. Um, and, you know, just bringing those things forth where they look at the individual. Uh, just because someone filed for bankruptcy doesn't mean that they're a bad person. Uh, they may have fallen on hard times. I remember when the housing market crashed, I was working in housing all my life and it left me homeless. Um, and it was scary getting those foreclosure notices, even though I'd been in housing and um, had my real estate, yeah, I had my real estate broker's license at that by that time. Um, you know, having to do a short sale on my own home. You know, it, it, it was a challenge and it was scary. Um, and I had to move back to my hometown of Cordial and double up with someone. But technically I was homeless. Uh, but thankfully I found a small mom and pop renter who um, took a chance on me 
And, you know, I was just honest with them and told them what happened. And um, they took a chance on me, and I was able to rent and then rebound uh, and then, you know, um, was able to get stable, sustainable housing. Um, but, you know, we have to understand that things, life happens, and we have to be open, um, open-minded open enough to give people a second chance. But at the same time, I do believe in screening. Uh, so you do, you do need to screen, um, but... <laughs> You know, I, I would say just look at it on an individual basis, but you also have to be aware of fair housing uh, issues as well. Uh, so you don't want to fall, fall into the fair housing pitfall. Um, but that is something that I know Georgia Act is looking at on the state level uh, around some type of eviction reform that will hopefully open up more options for people um, so they can get in those affordable housing units. Jeff, do you want to take that sure. kind of question? Sure, I'll, I'll take the same question. And I think a lot of this, you know, there, there, there are some creative ways. There are a lot of resources out there that can assist people. Um, you know, a realtor can help you uh, find some of these sources. But, um, but I think the root of the problem is, is that uh, there's a glut in the rental market right now. Uh, there is a, there's a lack of inventory. I think that was one of our items on here. But when you look at what's going on in Georgia, when you look at what's going on around the nation, there's a, a stark decline in the percentage of building permits being issued versus those that, that are being applied for. The time frame is growing wider and less are being issued than um, in recent years. There's a need for housing, but there are greater governmental kind of roadblocks and hindrances that keeping that product from essentially getting to market. And it's just like any product. When, when you have a lot of people wanting to buy it and you don't have mm -hmm. as much, the prices go up. Mm -hmm. Also, when you have that, uh, you know, think about if you go to the store and they have a lot of one product and not enough people to buy it, what do they do? They put it on sale, they make it easier to buy. Mm -hmm. um, when you don't have as much, you know, if, if there's a, a run on bananas or something, you know, they're gonna be more expensive and they're going to be harder to buy. So I think when you when you flip it, and this is not to sound cold with it, but when you have people that are landlords, when you have people that are selling property, are they going to come up with ways to get someone in there that's harder to get into that property right. when two seconds later they got this buyer that's ready? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so I think yeah. part of the answer to the problem is attacking what's causing it in addition to tapping into some of the, the great resources that are there that can help individuals get into either, you know, either get into housing, you know, just to start with, or getting into home ownership. Because the wealth building that comes with home ownership is something that, you know, is, is what most of the latter half of the 20th century was built on. Right. And you can go back and look to see, you know, communities that primarily stayed renters and those that were able to have the home ownership and you look at the wealth building that was able to occur with that and that should be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a home that is sold, regardless at what level, you can trace it back to several other homes that then it's a chain reaction. So while this house may be someone's dream home that they're buying, that frees up the one that they left. That one frees up the one that the other, per you know, and so on and so on. Uh, I've seen a report that traced it back several steps and how much of an economic boost to a local area that one home sale generated in that mm -hmm. uh, for one home sale uh, think about everything that goes with that the the moving you know paying the movers mm -hmm. uh, paying the real estate professionals paying the the secondary parts of that you know just that all go with it, the appraisals the inspectors that kind of thing but then also think about when they move there most people find that that's a great time to go ahead and paint the house, have some repairs done, do some upgrades, go buy some new appliances, new cabinets, get some furniture. The tens of thousands of dollars that are generated locally from that one home sale, and then you multiply that out for those that are moving up within a community. If you only have the options of this high standard and this, you're only getting one of them. Right. But if you have the flow up, you're getting the chain it's of all that. Progression. Yeah, exactly. One thing we didn't mention that didn't come up on our um, challenges were natural disasters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've had so many hurricanes and storms and tornadoes where people's properties are just destroyed. They're obliterated. Mm -hmm. And floods 
it's it's always been just so crazy yeah. to right. me that your homeowner's insurance is separate from flood insurance. <laughs> right. I don't understand right. that. Right. But um, but that's a challenge. People who are not in flood zones or are not in these areas that would be required to have this additional level of insurance, all of a sudden suffer this loss, and they can't. They yeah. they've lost everything. Mm -hmm. um, has anyone in the room had issues with natural disasters? I know our neighbor community in Albany, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that are mm -hmm. still without housing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and again, you know, mm -hmm. thankfully we're getting some relief from our federal government to, mm -hmm. to trickle down on those those areas. Uh, not only housing, but in other other areas. Anyone had any natural disaster area issues in your community where things have happened, Bill? drives that market for building materials, right. you know, so for, for that yep. new construction, yeah, it's a challenge. Go first, or do you want to? You can go first. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> um, you know, uh, flood insurance. You know, national flood insurance program is something that is keep keeps coming up for renewal. We're mm -hmm. we're pressuring or pushing for um, a longer term solution with that. Mm -hmm. Part of that is the mapping. The mapping is one of the biggest problems we see. Um, example of what we see: we see areas that probably should be in flood zones that aren't. Mm -hmm. And then we see, I remember I was up in the mountains looking way down into Lake Dunn, And I was told that I was in a flood zone where I was standing. Because if you're not standing right there and you're looking at a map and you see a lake and you just check a highlighter and draw around it, that's a flood zone. You know, I want to see that lake rise 200 feet up to where I was standing. We'll all be on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, Somebody better call Noah. And, and, and that, you know, that, that's something that, you know, is, uh, that's something that I know, you know, realtors, I, I think you've probably gotten the, the notices from us of, you know, oh, yes. click here and, mm -hmm. you know, send in a call for action type thing. Mm -hmm. But that's something we're, we're, we're looking at that as, as one of the problems to what we've been seeing in the state is, um, the wrong people being put in the flood zones and and that insurance being available to the right people you know to the you know all that kind of stuff getting that cleaned up can help with some of the yes. problem but there are some disasters that just they aren't that right you know it, it's totally separate from that and um, you know it's again I think when you're already at a low inventory and something hits it shows you kind of you know, it's kind of like when you're driving down the highway and you got bald tires and then you get a, you know, you hit a pack of nails somewhere, you realize that there's not much else to go on, you know, right. so. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. We've just got a few more minutes before. Yes, sir. You know, relates back into our you know requirements. Yes, ma'am. One of the things we as local officials might look at is lowering the or the impact fee mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. building low income. 
Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's very controversial is raising minimum wage. Right. Because those are students that are working or younger kids that have seniors, but that would help people right. to be able to, to, be able to afford more, more with their dollars. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right. Yes. Who who should be the home buyer? Should it be an investor or should it be a home buyer? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Right. Right. And that's something we can all we can all work on with our legislators, and as as these uh, conversations take place, we've got just a few more minutes. We'll take a few more comments. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Right, which preserves your neighborhoods and preserves historic resources and things like that. Exactly. That's a, that's an excellent idea. Did you have a comment? Yes. Yeah, one of the things we're looking at too is uh, bringing in workforce training um, and working at it from the other direction. Is you know, of course, bringing the housing costs down is important, but lifting up the wage earners, mm -hmm. which was kind of ties into your comment about the yeah. minimum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and by training the work, right? You know, to know how to do something besides cutting grass, or right? Right. 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 Things like that that are being created across the street, uh, across the st across the state, not across the street, across the state. Um, it is about workforce training, and that's such an important part. Did you want to address any of those comments? Yeah, and, and actually, these kind of work well. There's there's a 
little, little, I guess, bundle of things that, that this kind of sparked. But um, one thing I want to mention before we're done with all this is, you know, brag on, you know, working with Michael and y'all folks down at the Capitol. Um, so a couple years ago, we realized that uh, going back about a dozen years, uh, we had created kind of a monster by, you know, putting a law in place that created more of a problem than just what it was solving. Now, it solved the problem, but it was, it was affecting blight and blighted mm -hmm. properties, and it was preventing uh, local governments from taking property for blight mm -hmm. and turning it into a shopping mall. You know, it was kind of the let's, let's protect the homeowner type thing. And it's still there, that protection is still in place, but uh, what had been in, put in in 2005 was requiring the local jurisdiction to maintain that property for 20 years if they took it. So what do you do? You don't want to take that. It's an albatross. Um, we worked together and we got something in place so you can now have a taking of blighted property and then put it mm -hmm. back on the market for the same legal use. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about something about how do you get the land, how do you get the where to bring it, possibly bring in the cottage uh, type stuff, if you establish the legal use, of, you know, residential or the, you know, the gap on the size, whatever you're talking about, and it's a blighted area, you can do a taking and then that addresses part of the, the initial cost of it and then turn it into a way to get something done. The workforce uh, element of that, uh, spent a few years working in that area. Um, there's a lot of money that comes down from the federal government mm -hmm. and there's a lot that's available in state on workforce training. And, you know, right, yeah. and, and some of what can happen that works with all this is um, when you look at the two new stadiums that were built in Atlanta, they were built using a lot of workforce on the job training, mm -hmm. getting people skilled in construction, mm -hmm. teaching them how to, you know, not only how to do it, but hey, this is a trade that can benefit and, you know, you, you'll be marketable after doing this type thing. So I'm, I'm looking at this as, look, you got some areas where you got some dilapidated homes, you got some, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to identify the owner, it qualifies as blight, you know, that's something where perhaps you could have, you know, working with your local workforce development, your local um, college and career academy, technical mm -hmm. college, whoever, put something together where you have training done to help build some of these, mm -hmm. these you know, places that are in need. And so that may be a way to accomplish some of that. Excellent. Yes, through the uh, creation of land bank authorities. Um, and I know several municipalities are looking at that. I know um, Macon County uh, has established a land bank authority. I think they were the most recent. Um, <clears throat> but it's very important that we eliminate blight in the communities uh, because blight is an economic development issue. A lot of times if a business is coming into, into your community as an elected official, sometimes they will let you know, sometimes they will not. They will come into the community and they will ride around. And so we have to look at this and get the communities buy-in. Uh, I always believe in what we call clean communities when I served on the Cordell Chris Chamber. Um, looking at your keep whatever beautiful, Chris beautiful, Tiff beautiful, working with those agencies. And also working with agencies such as the Georgia Heirs Property Law Center and Georgia uh, legal services to help clear up those air property issues. I did an air property workshop in Cordial uh, about two weeks ago, and we had people come as far away as Brunswick and Griffin, all the way to, to Cordial, to get the information to determine how to eliminate um, air property by having wills and doing estate planning. Uh, because the example that the presenter gave that one um, plot of land had 187 heirs. Yes, that's, that's a lot. And so, you know, people, they need their homes fixed, and this is bringing it back to the municipalities, you know, they don't qualify for the home repair programs um, because they're not the owner of record. You know, there's a real estate terms, we say there's a cloud on the title. Uh, and also for Habitat, when I worked at Habitat, you know, people would get mad because we couldn't fix up their homes because we go in queue public, there wasn't the, there wasn't the owner. Uh, so working with uh, those agencies uh, who can help people clear up those air property issues that will also help blight, again, land banks, uh, authorities, and then uh, hopefully we can attract some development uh, favorable, managed, good development into our communities. Chairman Wiggins, did you have your hand raised? You, you hit it right on the head. I was going to ask a question about the land bank authority because that's one thing that the you know, city of Fort Hill is looking at now. Uh, we're trying to get, you know, you got to have cooperation with all of the tax collecting energy.
Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize Corinne Thornton in the back of the room with the Department of Community Affairs. She's a pretty little girl waving her hand. Uh, DCA has some incredible programs that help with housing. So many times we think of DCA as our source for grant funding for infrastructure and things, which is very, very important. But they have some wonderful programs. And I think that the takeaway from all of this is there's no one answer to housing issues, whether it's design guidelines, historic preservation, affordable housing, density, zoning, more regulation, less regulation. It's something that we all need to be aware of because if our citizens don't have a place to lay their head at night, what does that say about the future of our communities and how do we handle that? So. Um, we are out of time. I do want to take this opportunity to let each of our presenters make a few closing remarks. I want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your valuable time with us this morning. And I hope you've picked up some ideas, maybe heard some, maybe <laughs> if nothing else, sometimes you sit in a, in a uh, presentation like this, you realize, you know, there are some things I can do in my community and it's not maybe as bad as I thought, but if it is, these are some resources that I can, can certainly, uh, certainly use and address in my town to take back to my fellow elected officials. And, and work with uh, our regional commissions and the various resources we have to us as, as elected officials. So I'll turn it back. Bambi, would you like to make any closing remarks, any comments, yes. any last words of wisdom we can leave with our visitors this morning? Yes, thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak today. Uh, Georgia Act is a statewide nonprofit affordable housing membership organization comprised of nonprofit developers, municipalities, financial institutions, and anyone that is interested in affordable housing. And we do encourage you to join Georgia Act um, because that gives you a chance to network with those developers, especially our nonprofit developers who are mission based who can do affordable housing. Uh, we also come in and provide technical assistance to municipalities. The city of Albany uh, has gotten a lot of technical assistance. Um, glad to see Sylvester here is where my uh, maternal uh, family is from. Um, but I also just stay engaged. I know you can't do the L word, which is lobby, um, but we can, uh, our partners here can, we do hire uh, a lobbyist to assist us. And we can, if you tell us what we need, we can advocate for you uh, on the state and federal level to bring those dollars outside of Washington into Georgia to bring those dollars not only throughout Atlanta but throughout the rest of Georgia. And the one takeaway that I would say is to definitely get your resident and citizen buy-in. Uh, it is so important to get them bought in, get them at the table. If you don't have a local housing task force, I serve on the Atlanta Housing Commission, establish one, get some citizen input um, so that they are aware. And a lot of times they just don't know or don't understand uh, so that you won't have them on the back end protesting about something, um, you know, an ordinance or, or something that was done. But get your citizen involvement and that help builds a better community. Well, uh, we, we have about, we have 50 boards around the state, and so where, wherever you're at, we've, we've got realtors there. And uh, the, the good thing about realtors, what I love working with them and representing them is they're very active. I, I looked at our most recent uh, data, and it was, I think, 90% are registered to vote, and in the last election, almost 80% turned out when at the state level it was about half that. So. Um, you know, they're active, they're engaged in the community, and we at the state level support those boards and can help get them the tools they need. So whether it is a downtown redevelopment thing, whether it's a, a housing um, affordability issue, whether it is fair housing, whether it is you name it, if it has to do with housing, if it has to do with, um, you know, community building, economic development, placemaking even, um, we may be able to tap into some resources and partner um, partner with you. Um, there was a, an alleyway project in Noonan that we just participated with that was really cool, kind of bringing a, a vacant, kind of ugly eyesore of a you know place where uh, you know kind of kind of broaching into almost a blight area. 
uh, that's now become a public gathering place where they have little concerts and some things like that. Uh, but all over the state, there are these type of things that we can help with. Um, and sometimes it may just be sitting down and looking at you know, helping to come up with solutions to a problem that you have that may be you know, maybe it's not tapping into a program. It's just a, if we shift this, maybe this will ease this burden here and it'll bring it in. Um, so reach out to us and, and we want to we want to be there to work with you and, and help you locally, you know, wherever you're at and not just at the Capitol. So. Thank you. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a wonderful discussion this morning. Just want to remind you that our luncheon is following this presentation in the Chatham Ballroom. I think you have just a few minutes to take a quick break, but thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of your day.